the role of content, uh, the role of websites in digital marketing. And we'll talk about um, a bit about um, how you can actually, the website development process, the, the design process, the planning process, we'll talk about development tools. And as I mentioned, we'll talk heavily about how we can make a website more effective. So, so the role of the websites in digital marketing strategy is obviously, you know, it's, it's frankly, it's, it's crucial, particularly when we talk about digital marketing. Um, we, you've got to imagine that the website's sitting at the heart of everything that we're doing, you know, and in the last few weeks, we've been talking about, you know, search marketing, um, search engine optimization, social media advertising, social media marketing, all of these, all of these activities that we perform on other platforms, in the main, they're about reaching a, a target audience on those platforms. And in the main, most of the tactics we're employing are about bringing um, some, a subset of that audience onto our website, onto our owned platform. So clearly, you know, it's absolutely crucial. So before we, before we like dive into the main stuff, I thought let's just get the technical, the techie stuff out of the way. Um, so most websites, um, the majority of websites out there these days will, will have um, what's will sort of be built on what's called a three-tiered architecture. And what it means is you've got a presentation, a front-end layer. So when we go and actually look at a website and we're looking at it on the screen and we see some nice pictures and nice words, that's the presentation layer that sits along the top. Um, let me pull up a website. Let's pull up Mint Twist. <clears throat> so when you, if you right click on a website and you view the page source, most of you probably have sort of seen this stuff. All of this, this is HTML, this is, um, and this is the front end layer of the code. And what browsers do, whether it's Chrome or Internet Explorer or whatever, they turn um, compliant HTML into, into, what we, into what we see. So this is, this is what we see as humans because the browser is turning this HTML code into what we see. So that's the, that's the front end layer of, of a website. But most websites, most websites will, will have a collection of data that's stored inside a database. And so when we log in, for example, to Facebook, and when we log into Facebook, we're presented with um, a feed of all of our friends and all of our photos, all of our friends' photos. It's collecting all of that information from a database. So obviously it wouldn't be a very good idea for Facebook to serve up all of that database information and send it to our, to our computers because then hackers would just have a complete field day. So the reason why you've got this three-tiered actual architecture, one of the reasons why is that the database layer, which is at the bottom here, sits inside a server that that is not that and that data is not sent to the presentation it's not sent to the the visit the website visitors computer like the presentation layer code is sent and and so the data that sits inside a database needs to be accessed by a programming language um, that that might be java it might be .NET, it might be c sharp and there there are many others but those types of programming languages are, are, um, some in in the I guess in the industry you would call this software development and this database development and this might be sometimes front end development. So there are different types of developers out there, and some of them will will have transferable skills. But typically, and and this is the case inside Mint Twist, we've got some developers that specialize in the front end code and making things look really great. Um, but also work seamlessly. And then we've got developers that are very strong at creating um, functional application layer code. And typically those developers will also have strong database skills as well. So look, why have I sort of gone into the detail here? I suppose the key thing from the perspective of the people out there is that 
um, there, there is a world of difference between a brochure based website that's, that's really focusing on, on the front end and presenting information really clearly. And actually there, there might not be much going on on the database perspective because it's, it's not a very functional website. That website is, is you know, um, a relatively simple website and therefore the cost to develop it you know, can, um, might, it might be less than you know, 15,000 pounds. But if you're talking about a very, very functional website, then it might look the same on the front end as a simpler website, but it might cost you know, 100,000 pounds or a million pounds. You know, the, depending on how, how much integration work goes on underneath will, will determine the cost for a very sort of functional website. And similarly to support a very functional website, you know, the, the skills and the amount of time that you need to make changes to it, you know, might be considerably more than a simple website. So as always, um, if there are any questions, put them in the chat. Um, because I'm presenting today, hopefully one of my Mintus colleagues will, will answer them um, or, and or, um, yeah, I'm more than happy for someone to turn on their mic and ask a question as we go as well. Okay, let's continue. Okay, so let's talk about different types of website pages. Then, so we introduced this concept of Hero Hub and, and hygiene, and you know, you don't need to um, go over the. Detail. Let's talk about how it works in the context of types of web pages. So we would look at a website, and this is a car hire company. And if you see a page like this, which is in this case, it's the it's the make an inquiry for a car hire page, or if you see a product page or a service page, we would you know, inside the interest in the industry, I guess we we refer to that to that as hygiene content. And so the, the thing about this type of page is that it's all about making the user do that one specific thing, which in the case of this example is, you know, fill out um, a collection destination where I want to collect my hire car, where I want to drop it off and the dates that I want to do that and then press the search button. So all of, all of this, the, the architecture of this page and the design and the layout of this page is orientated around making the user take that particular action. We don't really want to divert the user away from a page like this because it's kind of like the money page um, on, on the website. It's, it's at the bottom of the funnel of the website, if you like. And so the way that you would evaluate a page like this would be, would be very much around how many people get to the page and of that, of those people who did get to the page, what percentage of them actually take the primary action that we want them to take? So it's, it's the conversion rate of that page. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, about that um, in, a, in a few moments. Um, how well is it scoring? So you, you would measure the conversion rate and that would be a measure of how effective that, that page is. Um, and what you're really trying to do is if 5% or 10% of people take the action, great, that's our benchmark, but then how can we improve it? And, you know, one example on, on a page like this is these are the messages that reinforce why Hertz would be a good place to rent your car from. And this is an example of, you know, helping the user to be more confident about taking that next step. In e-commerce websites, you'll often see all of the, um, security type symbols that make people safer about sharing their payment details and things like that. Okay. From an SEO perspective, the hygiene pages are, re are really where we want our, our money phrases optimized for. So let me twist, we've got a web design page and we've got an SEO page. The SEO page is really where we want um, all of the SEO, keyword research, backlinks, we want them all pointing to the SEO page. So hygiene pages will typically have your kind of money key phrases. And if we're talking about search engine optimization pages, project, those pages would be the ones with, with where we want to send 
the search traffic and where we want to point the, the SEO strength for that, the phrase that's related to that particular hygiene page. Okay, and when we talk about hub content, classically it's like it's blog content type stuff. And the thing about blog content is this is the stuff that we're probably using to try and, to try and capture um, awareness and to capture potentially new or potentially existing audiences. But we're capturing them in a way where we're capturing their, their interest based on something that's related to our products and service as opposed to our, our actual product and service. And this is obviously you know, really where a, a large overlap happens between PR and digital marketing because in the world of PR, we're creating lots of awareness con type content that can be interesting to, to wide audiences that are, that are still relevant uh, to our clients. And this type of content is brilliant because typically it's more interesting to a wider audience. Um, and I, you, know, you can tell me much more than I can tell you about this stuff. But from a digital marketing perspective, it's also an opportunity for us to link from this type of content to the relevant hygiene page. So this point at the bottom here is kind of the key one. If we're going to create content like this, and if it's successful content, then in order to maximize its value from a marketing perspective, we want to make sure it's appropriately linked to the right hygiene pages. So that if some of the audience that does come in um, and engage that content, if they do so happen to be interested in getting a car hire quote, it's kind of easy for them to make that next step. So that's the way that we engage a, a, a real world person, but also, you know, and, and as, <coughs> as we were talking about in, in week two, when we spoke about search engine optimization, this type of content is really the opportunity for us to, um, to increase our footprint from an SEO perspective. So if we have this type of content and if we can load in, you know, car hire London, you know, and if obviously it needs to be relevant, but if we can load in a phrase like that and use the anchor text um, on a blog page that's getting traffic from um, external sources and backlink it to our hygiene page, then we increase the strength of our hygiene page um, from an SEO perspective for the phrase car hire London, you know, or whatever. And so hygiene, <coughs> hygiene content, um, you know, and plays two really important roles in digital marketing and you know, lots of PRs probably you know, don't even know how much power they have with the content they create. It engages people in the real world on external platforms to bring them in to the website. Great, more traffic on the website, brilliant. But it also has um, potentially correctly marked up, and we'll talk about that today, correctly marked up from an SEO perspective has a significant um, opportunity to, to positively impact the, um, the SEO value of the whole site and, and obviously individual phrases based on the context of, of any particular piece of content. Okay. And then, you know, and we've got hero content and in this example, Hertz have created, you know, an ultimate American, an ultimate um, road trip, uh, like guide to the USA possibly targeting you know, um, foreign tourists out from outside of the USA who are going in and who want to hire a car and you know, have that all-American experience. And this, this sort of content is big and loud and it's PR type stuff. And again, we just want to make sure that from a digital marketing perspective that it's correctly marked up and then correctly linked to either hygiene content or, or hub content so that those audience members that are that do happen to be interested in taking the next step. And obviously it will be a subset, but for those people who are interested, we want to make it as easy as possible for them to make the next step. Okay. All right, um, next. Okay, so I thought I'd put in here um, a a bit on landing pages um, because they're really important. So 
the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about social media advertising, we've talked about Google advertising and Google AdWords. Pretty much all of the advertising that, um, you know, best practice and certainly what, what Mintos do would be to any advertising campaign, we want to ideally send users to a dedicated landing page as opposed to, you know, the home page or even a generic hygiene page. And the reason for that is if you're taking the opportunity to go and target a very specific audience in a very specific way with a specific message, then you, you would significantly increase the chances of that being ultimately a successful engagement. And first of all, if they click on the advert, that's successful anyway, because that's, you know, that's not an easy thing to get people to do, at least in large numbers. But those people that do click on adverts, once they do get to our website, we, once we've done that you know, amazing work to get them there, we want to give ourselves the best chance of them being able to take the next step in the process. And this is, this is what landing pages really do um, so well, because they, we can relate them so specifically to, to, the, um, to the nature of the advert that brought them there in the first place, we can cut out all of the fluff and just focus on the action. And so this landing page here, you know, they do it now, this is the thing we actually want them to do. The headline relates to the message that, you know, I'm talking about an ad, but there are other ways, but let's talk about an ad because it's the best example. Whatever the message in the ad was, the headline's gonna reflect it. Whatever the imagery in the ad was, the image here's going to reflect it. A secondary headline gives a bit more detail, some key bullet points, and then we just want them to click. Um, the testimonial is there just to, just to support the, the user to give them a bit more confidence, you know, and, and so this is, this is a kind of a famous infographic called the anatomy of a perfect landing page. And it's quite, uh, it's, yeah, it's quite a good one. Okay. Right. Talk now a bit about the website planning process. So for those of you out there who have clients that are asking you, um, you know, I want to build a new website or I, I want to refresh a new website. Um, and obviously, you know, we, we've, we've had thousands of these conversations and they're brilliant conversations. But we find that the best way to, to sort of guide a user um, to, to help them to make the right decisions, but also to start build, build the build the foundations, the building blocks of us being able to work with them together to create a successful website. There are some there are some sort of steps in the process that you need to guide a user through in order to be able to cr to create like a really sensible and meaningful brief. So many times clients will create their own brief, and that's absolutely fantastic. It's brilliant that they've started that, but sometimes there will be holes in in those briefs. And so I'll we'll sort of talk you through now the the, the sort of the main things that we would say you know help a web design and development company to create a really effective website. So obviously the, the four key, the four obvious ones are, and you could just say, say this off the back to clients, is what, what do we want to say? What's the key message? What's the objective of the website? Who, obviously, who's the audience? You know, and, and then there is this thing about how we, how we want them to feel during that interaction. And obviously that's where design you know, really comes to the fore. But then it's also, you know, what do we actually want them to do? So, if it's an e-commerce website, it's, you know, it's buy something, it's create a customer account. But if it's not one of those things, what, what is the sales process? If it's a marketing website that, under, that underpins the website. So how do we want clients to, to inquire? Um, are there any tactics that you're employing that we want to connect with, with the website functionality? Okay, so we sort of talk about four step planning process, define the message and the audience, define uh, the perception, define the actions, the key goals, if you like, um, your goals from us as a website owner and brand, what we want our audiences to do on our websites. And then all of that really drives the, the content as opposed to the other way around or ideally. So these, these are the specific questions. What's the primary message? What's the major purpose of the website? 
Are there any specific short-term and long-term goals for the website? If there are, we need to know about them so we can build them in. Target audience. Um, the primary competitors, you know, like with, with lots of things in, in marketing, having a look at what the competitors are doing, you know, is really useful um, in many ways because we might be able to steal some ideas. But we actually, what we really want to do, and certainly this has always been, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's direction of travel for Mint Twist is that if we build a website for any client, we want to build them the best website in their particular industry niche. So we will look at the competitors, benchmark what, we, what, and what they're doing. And what we suggest to, to our clients will be um, a project that will put them ahead of all of their competitors. You know, if you're going to rebuild, redesign your website, why not? You know? Um, and then obviously understanding the, the thing about USPs is like everyone throws it around, but on a website, it's, it's kind of, it's absolutely fundamental, particularly if, if our clients are in competitive industry sectors, because it's, and we sort of touched on this, I think in week one, but as, as clients are going down the funnel in modern customer journeys, a lot of the qualification that prospective customers are doing is, is um, it, there's no interaction with, with the brand or with us as the, you know, the marketers, the marketing team, or the sales team, that that um, value judgment is being played out online. And in many cases, if a, if a prospective client has shortlisted you know, us or our, or our clients, then they have shortlisted them in their own minds. They haven't notified those brands that they've been shortlisted. And they're making value judgments based on the relative contents of their websites. And so the reason why USPs are so important is if you really do have, or if our clients really do have a genuine unique selling point, and if we can present that very, very clearly on our websites, and if we can do it in a way so that we get that message across to our, to our ideal client, and if it's our ideal client, they're going to resonate with that unique selling point and and so it can't really be stressed enough that the unique selling point needs to really come out in the content and the design and the functionality of, of a website because ultimately that will make it um, more effective okay and perception you know how are you currently perceived if it's a you know a brand repositioning exercise is going on you know how do you want to be perceived if, if you want to change your positioning um, <clears throat> we, we often ask uh, as well as competitors we often ask clients for a list of websites that they just like um, you know as much as um, the mint twist mantra is your website is for your mr. or mrs. client your website is for your client it's not for you you know we will say that to our clients the truth is, at the end of the day, there's normally someone, and it's very often the person who's signing the checks, who, if they don't like what they see, they're just not going to be happy. So obviously, you know, we need, it's a trade-off. And so we want to know what sort of websites, um, you know, the, the project sponsors you know, like, and it doesn't need to be in their industry. <coughs> okay. And then, so step three is defining the actions that we want um, visitors to, to take. And I suppose the key here is um, the primary action, if we're talking about, um, let's say, a lead generation website um, for a software company, the primary action might be <coughs> to um, sign up for a demonstration or you know, a consultation or something like that. Now, if that is the primary action, um, that that's not a primary action that you would take from the home page or possibly not directly from the home page, but you would want the home page to signal that for the audience members that are ready to take that next step, that is where they need to go. And we would have a dedicated page that's set up to, um, to tell people the benefits of signing up for a demonstration or consultation, and obviously introduce the form functionality as quickly and easily and as seamlessly as, as possible. Um, and so the primary action 
from the from the home page might not necessarily be the primary action that you would want them to take um, before leaving because in most cases there's going to be a number of different audience types and they're going to have a number of different objectives and the home page in a really simplistic sense is almost like you know, if you're walking in into a department store or you know Harrods or something like that, and you've got a little map that tells you this where the toy section is, this is women's fashion, this is men's fashion, is you know the food court, and that the home page is kind of designed to send the different audience members off in the right direction. Now, if Harrods just so happens to make 90% of its profits from the food court, and that's the most important set of audience, then obviously it's going to design its website homepage in a way where it puts more prominence on um, yeah, and the most important audience or, or, and or action that it's trying to push. Okay, and then there are, there are some elements that you might want to have on, on every page. And a good example of that is, is contact information, particularly if it's a site that's looking to invite people to, to contact and make inquiries, then you know, having contact information universally available is a very good idea you know and then and then you've got this this whole you know content thing and i think there are there are two or three um uh, groups inside finn where there's conversations going on with mint twist teams and we're having conversations about content audits so very often when Mint to start a website project, a content audit will be, you know, a really major component of that project. Yeah, and that's at one end. But also, what we're doing with, um, and we're doing this with a couple of you just now, is talking about running mini audits for mini clients that are potentially going to um, to look at doing something with their website and/or SEO. Okay, still people in the meeting. Okay, and so we can, um, so defining our website content, it's kind of like, you know, what, what, what you, you need to know everything else before you define the ideal type of content that's actually needed. And obviously on week two, we spoke about SEO and there might be a lot of content we need to support an SEO project as well. So the idea is, is that you do, you capture the information, you capture the strategy, you capture the objectives, the goal, the audience, the message, how it's going to connect with the, your sales strategy. We capture all of that information so we know what, so then we can articulate what sort of the right content would look like. If there's an SEO project that's going along the side of it, we would have done the keyword research and looked at the competitors and found all of the opportunities and we know that the content that we need from an SEO perspective so we've got the content for the real world people. We've got the content for SEO and Google that we absolutely need. So then we go away and evaluate what do we have at the moment. And invariably, there will be gaps. So Mint Twist will talk about content gap analysis. And I think Robert and some of his team, you know, have been, we've been having these conversations with, with some of their clients about where there's gaps in the content. And the great thing about the content gap analysis from a Finn partner's perspective, is you come out with a list of, of tasks that are effectively you know, titles of blogs in many cases and types of pages and bits of content that are just missing from a, from a client strategy and they need them to engage their audience and they need them to, um, to optimize for search. And so, that, that process works particularly well if you're going to redesign and redevelop or even just refresh a website because you can kind of put it all in one project, but it can also work as a standalone piece, just off, slightly off piece there, but hopefully that's relevant to some people. Okay. Here's an exercise for you to try at home. Just have a look at one of your client's websites and just ask yourselves these questions and you'll probably find that when you look at most websites, there's always some disconnects and you know, it might be fuel for a conversation. Okay, I'll just talk a little bit about the process. Um, so in terms of, in terms of um, the design process, so we've spoken about website planning. Now I'm gonna speak about website design and we'll speak a bit about development. And then we'll talk about how the whole thing hangs together. 
So once we've done that planning process that we've just spoken about, what we're going to have really is a really you know, strong website brief. So a client might come across with you know, three or four page website brief, brilliant. What we've done is put that brief through our planning process. We've beefed it out now. So we know exactly what we want to say. We know who we want to say it to. And we know what, the, what we want them to do on the website because the website is normally a step in a process. And, and so the website is then going to connect with the, um, the business process and the business strategy that obviously the wider organization is, is most concerned with. The website's just a tool to help them be more effective with their marketing communications, right? And so we, we've got this really clear brief um, when we've got this content audit and gap analysis. So the designers can then create a sitemap the wireframes and the designs that are going to allow us to deliver against that brief. And I'm pretty sure that most people on the call will be familiar with sitemap, but actually, you know, there's probably there's probably um, there's probably a few that, that don't, and that's you know no issue. So what a sitemap is 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 it's just a list of all of the main pages and actually all of the pages in a website, and it talks about how they connect with each other. So the idea is that if you've got um, logical groups of pages, you logically group them together. This helps for, in two ways, it helps um, users of the website to navigate a website in a coherent way. And the easier we make it for our users, the more effective a website is going to be. But it also, um, as with many things in digital, it's also friendly to the Google search spider bot so if google can come down an area of our sites and it finds a bunch of related content it's able to index our website in a, in a more um, effective way which allows us to compete more effectively from an seo perspective the website i mean um, a sitemap rather kind of implies a menu structure and very often um, you know our navigation menu structure on the website will look like a sitemap but it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one. once we've got a sitemap and you know this is for our for interest this is the kind of process we like to you know develop a sitemap and we share it with the clients and we ask them to sign off the sitemap once the sitemap has been signed off then we will create wireframes depending on the scope of the project, maybe for all of the pages, maybe normally for the most important types of pages. And these wireframes are their logical representations of the way that the information will be laid out on a page. So obviously they're not designs, it's, it's the step before a design, and it's really there to make sure that we organize the information in the most effective way to say so that, um, that page can do the job that it's supposed to do and provide the information that we want that page to provide for a user, but also crucially, make it easy for them to take the, the next most relevant step. So there's a few things to note when, um, when you're designing websites, most users, you know, think about yourself, you don't, users don't really read websites and read, it's very rare that you read every word on a page most users will scan a website and hopefully you can see my mouse and you'll scan in a z formation so users will start in the top left and then they'll scan to the top right and then they'll come down to the bottom left and then they'll scan across to the bottom right and so if you're or when designers are laying out a page it's good to to have that in your mind because that's how you would organize the information so you know, this is what I want you to look at first, second, third, fourth. The other thing that wireframes would typically articulate is, is, the, is what's called the fold line. So when you design um, websites with HTML compliant code, no matter, it doesn't really matter um, what the screen size is, in advance of the user playing with the aspect ratios, a web page will always render with the same fold line. So designers, we, Mint Twist, all designers can design for where the fold line sits. And so 
the most important thing there is obviously all of the most important information we want above the fold. If the if there's a if there's a crucial step, if there's a button that sits below a fold, then the effectiveness of that web page will be enormously negatively impacted because again, like most people don't read a web page, most people also don't scroll down to go, they're not going to go and searching for that button that you want them to press. If you don't make it easy for them, they'll 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 move on. They might not understand the function of the page, which is you know terrible. And so it's really important that you design for where the fold is. So look, if you've got all of the, the information that very often sits at the bottom of most websites, you know, it will be the, uh, the, the information that's um, you know, not as important. The key stuff needs to be above the fold. And then, you know, once a, a user's, once a client has signed off wireframes, then you can start to put the design on the top. I think the key thing here is, is really taking the clients down um, on a road so that we mitigate the amount of to and throwing that has to happen. Website projects are notoriously difficult uh, to complete uh, cost effectively because of the to and throwing that happens. So over sort of many, many years, Mintus has honed the process and look, nobody's perfect, but we've got quite good at bringing the client on the journey and actually the client likes it as well because they understand what they're getting at each step and they, they, and they buy into the process. Okay, so we've planned our website, we've designed our website. Now what we're doing here in, inside, inside of Digital Agency, inside Mint Twist, we're taking it from the designers and we're handing over typically to the developers. And let, let's talk then. So we've you know about what the whole process looks like so this is the planning and design phase that we spoke about you know we've got our designs we've got our website architecture and you know so we planned and designed the thing but now we need to go into build and so i mentioned we've got sort of our front end coding so the first step of building a website typically typically we'll talk about different types of websites later on um, but it would be taking those page designs and actually turning them into that HTML code that we saw before. So, you know, you have to be very skilled at what you're doing. And obviously there are tools that we use, but essentially you're creating, you're, you're trying to recreate a visual representation of what you want the website to look like by manipulating code like this. So that's the skill of a front end developer and mint twist uh, you know really lucky we've got some amazing front-end developers that, that work with us and so they're building html and css css stands for cascading style sheets and these are the things that help to enforce um, um, consistency across pages in terms of style which means you can set things like fonts and font size and colors and all that type of stuff and then CMS stands for content management system. Most websites, and in fact, all websites that Mintist build these days, even if it's a very simple website, you plug in the content management system and then it just creates more flexibility for managing the content. Even if the client has no interest in managing the content themselves, even if they want you know, us to, to support their content, it still makes sense to build in the content management system. A content management system is, you know, right at the top of this, I spoke about the three-tiered architecture. It is essentially a database and it needs some code to go and pull content out of a database and, and present it as part of the front end. Um, but the content management systems are so well sort of developed, it's not a complicated thing for us to see. We've got building blocks and we can pick them up. It's just a question of, of making that content management system reflective of the bespoke and tailored design that we've created for the front end of the website. <clears throat> if there are some elements of content that needs to be fixed, so like hard coded, um, then it's, yeah, it's really important we, we get sign off on those because those are the things that where it takes disproportionately large amounts of time to make changes. If someone wants to change some words and it's in a content management system, it's typically very easy to do that. And then we've got sort of the copywriting and 
what Mintis did you know, many years back was to completely separate the content with, with the, design, the job of designing and building. And for, for, for a number of reasons, really. Firstly, it's, it's um, in our view, and you might share this view, it's very often a job that the client will underestimate and potentially even undervalue, which is kind of disappointing but true. So what we typically say to the client is, look, you, you've got to manage this content bit. We will support you. If you need support, come to us. And typically the outset of a project, the client will say, yeah, fine, we'll, we'll kind of, um, we'll deal with the content, no problem, we can do that. But then when you get into the into the day-to-day -day process, certainly of a web design and rebuild, um, the client very often finds that actually it's more work than they thought and actually they're really busy and actually it's really valuable. So I will have your support, please. And this is obviously something that, that you guys would be, um, you know, the specialist at, at creating. <clears throat> okay, and then there's a, just a go live process. Um, and, you know, a few things to say about go live. It, it's, I guess, I'm guessing some of you out there might, might have sort of seen that you can launch websites with a big bang or you can launch them softly. I, I'm absolutely sure that you could, that there are, you could make a strong case for launching a website with a bang. But I suppose, just given with my pragmatic, you know, boring technical hat on, it's the problem with launching a website with a bang is that you, it's, it's almost normal for there to be some problems, particularly if it's a new website. So a, going, a go live quietly, you know, at a quiet time and without shouting too much about it is normally the advice we would normally give to a client unless there's some exceptional reason for them not to do that. You can test the website in a, in a sort of test environment, which obviously you do, you can do it as much as you want, but when you actually put a website on a live server and real world people start using it, there will probably be issues. And I suppose the other thing to say, what, what Mint Twist, what we've done sort of from the outset, um, and we're not the only people, we're not the only agency to do this, um, but we, we typically said to a client, look, as part of the cost of designing and developing, everything that we do, the intellectual property becomes, you know, your, it becomes your property. Once we, you know, once we put the website live, you pay the final invoice, you know, it's yours. So there's that kind of like notional handover of the intellectual property at the point of go live. And from a kind of, I guess, from a commercial perspective, um, the way that sort of we've learned that works best for clients is that there's a, there's um, a commercial bit of, it's a commercial agreement that underpins the planning, the design, the project management, the build, you know, potentially work with the clients on content. And once the client's ready to go live, that's the end. That's the end of that bit of project. And once and there, and then you move into a retainer based support service because any other type of um, trying to do bits of support work as a fixed price typically won't work for a client. Um, it will be too expensive for them and it's too bitty and there's too much to and throwing about um, chunks of money. So a support service, and it can potentially be you know, very low cost because once you've built, set up and optimised the website to support it, um, shouldn't cost that much money. To, and that can be reactive support and proactive support, reporting on the performance of the websites on a quarterly basis, what we do for virtually all of our clients. And that's it, and that's the whole process there. Right, let's talk a bit. Just see how far I am through this. Yeah, okay. So about I'm gonna go I'm gonna go till about eleven thirty. So we'll go for about another uh, uh, 40 minutes, 45 minutes or so, and then obviously we've got time for any questions. <clears throat> okay. Um so uh, responsive design. So responsive design is when we create, let me go back. So this is the Mintis homepage. This is what it looks like to a human. This is what it looks like from an HTML, CSS perspective. Responsive design means 
as we as I shrink down the the size of my window, it the code itself responds to the shrinking window. So you saw that this menu collapsed into a you know, a mobile phone style menu and the content reorganizes its, is itself appropriately so that it's optimized for a smaller window. So responsive design means that the code responds to the size of the window that it's being rendered in. Um, and it's quite intelligent, you know, and it basically, this stuff has to reorganize itself and there's coding in here to allow that to happen. So if a website designer or you know, if a website is not coded for that to happen, it won't automatically happen. What will happen is that it will scale down and everything will just get smaller version of itself. And what does that mean? On a mobile device, it basically means the website's you know, close, to, un, potentially at worst unusable and at best you know, a rubbish experience. And so what does that mean in real life? Well, in real life, it just means that website won't be anywhere near as effective on a mobile device as it would be on a desktop device. So if you've got clients out there and there are still many websites in the world, you know, I don't know what the stat is, but it's a huge number that aren't optimized, uh, that aren't made to, uh, that aren't designed to be responsive, which is, it, which is a fail in this, this day and age because most companies worth their salt will have visitors to their website that are coming from mobile devices. Okay, that's, so that's responsive design. And then a separate thing is obviously is mobile apps. So mobile app, we're, we're coding for our um, mobile devices. The key things to say here are, um, the, the thing about mobile apps, let's see if we've got it on the next slide. Yeah, we've got it there. So, um, so the thing to say for this slide is, um, if you create a, a, an app for iPhone, that's the type of code you have to create a different app for Android devices because they're essentially different operating systems that work. Uh, and then, you know, for the Microsoft uh, based phones and for the Nokia phones, and it's, it's another one again. Okay, so what's the difference between mobile, between mobile web means responsive. So it means, um, it means we're looking at that website on a browser versus an app. So platform independent, this means, is it independent of the type of device, meaning iPhone or Android? So as we just said, an app, no, it's not independent. You need to do a separate app for iPhone and a separate app for Android. If it's a, if it's a responsive website, um, whatever browser you use on your mobile phone will work. So if you use Chrome on your mobile phone or Safari or you know, whatever you use, Internet Explorer, the the, uh, the website the responsive website will render correctly so far as it's um, coded correctly for HTML, which we can assume it is. Um, a richer experience can be developed on an app because when you develop an app, we're taking remember the three tiered architecture. We said that the, the development code on when we're viewing a website in a browser, whether it's on our desktop or on our phone. There is no development code. It's just it's just front end code being rendered on our on our system. When we um, when we develop an app, what we're doing is putting code onto our phone. It's why you have to update an app. It's why you have to install it in the first place. But once you do that, and you you're essentially giving it permission to use functionality in this phone, so suddenly it knows where we are in the world with the geo location system. It can send us push messages. It can know which way I'm flipping it. Um, it can access our photos and videos and in pretty much any function that's on our phones, we can develop an app to take advantage of those functions. You can't go as far as that with, with um, essentially a responsive website that's running on your phone because it's not integrated into your phone in the same way. Um, the really powerful thing about an app is because people love their phones, you know, an app sits on my phone and as soon as I open my phone, you know, I've seen some apps here, you know, and I've got LinkedIn because I love LinkedIn and I've got Twitter. So those are the brands that, you know, I care about. They're on my phone. I'm seeing them every day. So there's some good, um, you know, brand awareness that you can get if you can create an app that uses app that your audience actually wants. 
Um, you can update responsive websites and they will update immediately. If you update an app, you need your users to update through the App Store. I think the, the final thing I want to say about apps is if, if clients want an app, um, but the best way to think about it is think about some really specific functionality that that client can deliver for its audience. So obviously, if it's e-commerce, you know, we, we can just make a shopping experience really seamless. That's why ASOS, this is their responsive website. They will want people to download the app as opposed to sit on the responsive website because the app has a richer experience. It's more functional. Um, it's easier to buy typically off from a well-developed e-commerce app. So for e-commerce, you know, it's a no-brainer. You build a really effective shop. But if you're non-e-commerce, um, you, it's got to be some sort of functional advantage to using the app over the website, as opposed to just creating an app for an app's sake. I'm sure you knew that. Okay, website conversion rate. So when we talk about in marketing, in the world of marketing, like what is the value of a good website? Well, for us, when we, when, well, for us, for me, it's about how effective that website is at converting a potential customer into someone who actually does the thing that that website's set up for them to do. And so, a little, just a quick sort of maths lesson. Let's just imagine we've got a B2B, you know, software technology client that has a website that has 10,000 visits per year from like, let's just assume they're the right potential type of customers. And that website drives 200 leads per, per year. So you know, 15 or so leads per month come through whatever lead capture tactic they're employing. So 200 as a percentage of 10,000 is 2%. So we can say that that conversion rate of that website is 2%. Um, and that's converting from visitors to leads. Now, if a client wants to say, well, you know, leads is one thing, but I want to talk about sales, so then you would need to say, you know, what is your, what is your sales team? So if we're a software technology company, we've got a sales team that's sitting there wanting leads to be you know, handed to them every day, and they want the website to do that. So they come to the digital marketing agency, you know, this is, this is what we're at. So we would then say, okay, so what is your conversion rate from leads to actual customers at the moment? And if it was 25%, that's great, 25% of 200 is, is 50 sales. And then you would kind of say to them, what's the average, just roughly, what is a customer worth to you, you know, over a year or whatever is meaningful for the client. Then you can say that if it was 20,000 pounds for you know, each of the software technology clients, um, average customer, 50 times 20,000 know, is, is a million pounds. So you can say that website's generating you a million pounds. And in a way, just having that conversation in our experience with clients, it kind of, it's eye-opening for them how valuable or not potentially their website is. And then, so what you're saying really is that that's a benchmark. And then whatever you do on website, when you're refreshing or redesigning or rebuilding a website, what you're trying to do is obviously do better than that. And you want to do better subjectively but this is kind of an objective way for those clients that like to buy you know hard facts and money this is the way to do it or one way to do it so then you would say okay we need to improve the conversion rates and the reason this is quite we're taking you through this process of you know going over who's your audience what do they feel how do we want them to feel all of that type of stuff is so that we can improve the conversion rate it's so that we can go from two percent to 3% because of the 98% of potential customers that went to your website last year that, that actually didn't end up making an inquiry, didn't even make an inquiry, it, there will be a significant portion, li likely there will be a significant portion of that audience that the only reason they didn't make an inquiry is because we didn't make it easy enough for them to do it or our lead, or our lead generation tactic wasn't enticing enough and actually by making some tweaks we can just nudge uh, nudge a little bit that conversion rate but you know as we'll see that a small nudge from two percent to three percent can make a big difference 
because 3%, let's assume that we've got exactly the same number of visitors. There's, not, there's no increase in visitors because um, we're just redesigning the website. We're not running any marketing, we're not bringing anyone else in at the moment. But if we redesign that website, we manage to go from two to 3%. 3% of 10,000 now means 300 leads. If the sales team converts at the same level, um, meaning 25%, 25% of 300, a quarter of 300 is 75 leads converted into sales. And so that website's then gone from 1 million pounds of new business revenue to 1.5 million pounds just because of a website project redesign process that might have cost you know a, a very small percentage of that 500,000 uplift and obviously that's excluding the you know the lifetime sales and um, LTV or what have you want to talk about it so uh, small increases in conversion rate potentially large increases of um, in terms of money and by the way these numbers you know they, they are real numbers we see these types of numbers they're normal numbers um for, for you know for normal medium-sized clients um it's worthwhile pointing out that's why we're on this topic um that's just refreshing a website if you take the, the clients on a digital transformation journey that's step one and then step two all part of the same project step two is let's integrate our pr you know and introduce some social so we can leverage this content and we'll mark it up better for seo and all of that all of that stuff gets more of the right people onto your website so you can talk about that ten thousand going up to twenty thousand or thirty thousand and so then you start to have really large orders of magnitude of business improvement and that's you know that's for me that's the combined sort of presentation that, that's so powerful between an integrated communications company that has skills in in creating awareness and PR and marketing and creative hooks but also can do you know understands how to design an effective website understands how to put digital marketing to good use to to drive those visitor numbers okay that's the sales page Okay, and here's an exercise for you at home. If you want, discuss three ways that you can improve the conversion rates of a client's website. If you go through them, you, you know, you'll see the good, webs, good clients know that what we're doing, they'll have really nice tactics on, on there. Um, yeah, and in some cases, they're, they're just, they're missing the opportunity to, to attract a client and get them to engage. So the conversion tactics is what you're looking at to, to improve the overall conversion rate of a website. I wanted to talk a bit about, because uh, the team spoke, just admitting some more people. Um, the team spoke in week two about search engine optimization. I just thought it might be worth just recapping so that for those of you who are out there who are like managing page content through a content management system, these are the, sort of the key things uh, to sort of look out for. So, all right. So, from an SEO perspective, from an SEO perspective, excuse me, um, from a, sorry, from an on-site SEO perspective. So the team spoke about on-site, off-site. Everything I'm talking about is, is on-site SEO here. So if we're um, creating a new page or adding a blog article or editing you know, a product page or a service page, these are the elements that we control, that you potentially control when you, when you manage a page, uh, when you manage the content in the content management system, that, most, that can most positively impact the SEO performance of that page. And depending on, on the, the state of the page at the moment, potentially they can have quite a big and a relatively quick impact. Okay, so the first one is page title. So what we mean by this, it's like the, it's the, the tag, the HTML tag looks like this, and it's title and it's closed title. But when we, when we go into our content management system, um, it's, it's actually 
it's what's shown it's what's shown here so hopefully you can see as i hover over that page you can see that there's a title come here and that's that's what it means by the title it doesn't mean crafting memorable experiences that that's a different thing that's like that's a title and that may be the title of the of the page but it it, it means the page title and so if we're talking about um, a university page, like, you know, let's just pull one up. Nursing degree random. Okay, so a Bachelor of Science in, in Adult Nursing. Just click there. So here, as we click over the page title, we can see they've got Adult Nursing uh, and then BSc, Bachelor of Science. So that's good, tick, because that page, they want it to optimize for the phrase Adult nurse, Nursing. And so they put it in their page title. If you want to optimize a page for, you know, um, on um, online accountancy system, then you know on the on the potentially on the home page or the key service page, you would put online accountancy system. Um, that the page title is also displayed in the SERPs, um, and what we mean by SERPs, just for those of you who can't remember from last time from the SEO course, the, these that these things are the page titles, and Google search will always render the page title when it shows a list of, of, of search results. SERP stands for search engine result positions, it means search pages. Um, so the page title will, will be used by the algorithm, but it will also be used by the human user who looks and reads and decides, shall I click on that one or that one? To, to, to a quite particularly large extent, the, the decisions can be driven by what we put in the page title. The key thing here, Team probably touched on it last time, but if you're going to put a brand in, put the brands to the right and not to the left, because Google will put more weighting on the words that are to the left. So we want our generic words on the left and our brands on the right. You know, what you see a lot of time is people will use this pipe to go description of the page, you know, name of the brand, if you want to include the brand in your, in your page title, which is a good idea because it shows on the SERPs. Um, 50 to 70 characters. I think you might be able to put more than 70, but Google will always trim it at 70. Um, and CTAs means call to action, you know, as we were just saying, pages do show on, on search results. So if you've got like a, a bit of hygiene content that's, you know, uh, you know, doing something, you know, how to create the perfect video marketing strategy you know, a, a, um, a start to finish guide coming soon, then, you know, that, that's a bit of content that you might be able to put some enticing words around as a title to help people to click through to it. Okay. Then there's this thing called meta description and inside most content management systems, when you're editing a page, you'll have the opportunity to enter a meta description. Now, in the olden days, Google used to use this description to help it rank search pages. It stopped doing that now, um, but this, it doesn't mean it's not important. It's really important because this text is also used in the SERPs. So the description here sits underneath the title in the search engine results uh, pages. And obviously, the more creative um, and, in, and alluring you can be with that description, the more chance users will, in, in larger numbers, click through onto a page. And actually that does have um, an interesting, um, although it doesn't directly be used by the algorithm, the, the higher the click through rate of, um, of a particular page that's being shown on search results, it will have a positive impact in the end on SEO, albeit an indirect one. Okay. And the actual URL is really important. So if, um, you know, and technically you can get control of, of this stuff as, as website developers, even if, um, a, even if you've got a content management system that's creating sort of spurious random names like one, two, three, four, five, six, 
78910.aspx, you can go inside the back end of these systems and you, you can put a sensible URL, uh, which, which will be easier for a human to read, but more importantly, it's really important for the algorithm. So the URL is, you know, behind the page, page title is, you know, probably the second most important um, factor. So inside some content management systems, you can, you can physically change the URL. So it's well worth doing that if you, if you see that you or your clients have capability of doing that, um, it's well worth doing that. Be cautious about changing it for website pages that are already up, I hasten to add. Um, but you know, speak to your developer, there are ways to, to get around it. It's really important from an SEO perspective. And then there's the H1, so heading, header sort of, um, header titles on inside the page content, they're really important. So again, if we're talking about adult nursing, then you would want adult nursing to be in the H1. Um, and there it is, H1, it's adult nursing, brilliant. And then there's H2s around heading two, you know, they're, they're quite important as well. H2 tags are important, again, left to right. Um, bullet, bullet points are not used by the algorithm directly, but I think the SEO team spoke the other week about um, featured snippets and page zero results. So if you got a list of, of you know, related points, putting them in a bullet point makes them more likely to appear um, as a featured snippet. For those of you, who, if you search something like top 10 best video editing platforms, sometimes you'll see Google will just present you with a bullet point list and it's pulled out that list from some sort of blog article and it will have a link to the blog article. So that's a way to circumvent all of the, all of the other pages that are ranking for that result. If you create a really nice bullet point list, increasingly Google's surfacing that sort of content as a featured snippet page zero result. <clears throat> Paragraph length, you know, um, in websites, shorter is better than longer. Tables, again, not used by algorithm, but again, like bullet points can be featured in page zero results, featured snippets. So internal links, um, the internal links means a link from one web, uh, one page in a website to another page in the same website. So for those of you out there, and there's lots of you creating really cool blog articles, PR articles, if we can um, create that content, but then internally link to a relevant hygiene page. So, you know, a great blog article talking about our software company's director who's been in the news. You know, if we can load in the, an internal link that says, brilliant accountancy software for medium-sized businesses, and the accountancy software is the anchor text that links to the service page or the product page that says accountancy software. That is an example of an internal link that will add value to the weighting of that website and that particular page for the phrase accountancy software. So in truth, when we do content audits, one of the, you know, almost every time that almost the biggest low hanging opportunity for almost any client is to, get, is to revisit all of their blog articles and, and create internal links that are going to the relevant hygiene pages. So that one exercise, identifying those opportunities and then making the changes, um, after some time will have a significant impact for many, many clients. From an SEO perspective, they will get more visitors from more relevant searches. Um, External links, yeah, we spoke about that before, so I won't go back into that. Um, then images, so when you're creating content or updating content and you put and you upload an image, inside, uh, hopefully I'm, some people will know what I'm talking about, but when you, when you upload an image into a content management system, you know you sort of get this little box pop up and it says, what's the title, what's the description, what's the alt, and it will have a number of boxes. It's really tempting just to maybe put in a title and then just press save because that's quicker. But if you fill out all of the elements and inside all of the elements, you always use the phrase or the phrases that are relevant to that particular page. 
again, it will have a pretty significant impact from an SEO perspective because all of those elements, um, even though they might not necessarily be shown on the front end, they'll be visible to the algorithm. Many of the, the tags, things like alt tags and stuff, you'll get it if you hover over an image, but it's also for things like screen readers, for people visually impaired and, you know, they're, they're, so, and, and, and the algorithm will read this stuff and it will make a determination that the website is more accessible, therefore I'm gonna give it a slightly higher score. And that's the logic behind uh, Google positively impacting um, images that are, that are correctly marked up, will, which will then also positively impact the page in which it, it resides. Um, bum, bum, bum. And the same goes for in, embedding video. Social sharing, so sharing content a page on social media, um, you know, it's it's has an indirect positive effect on, on the website. It won't, it's not a direct ranking factor from an SEO perspective. Okay, here's another one to try at home. Um, hopefully everyone knows you can download the slides, you can watch replays of the video on the um, on the Finn Partners internal systems, but here's one that you can try at home if you want to. Right, our last little section then for the next 10 minutes or so, I'll just talk a little bit about development platforms and then I'll talk about, I'll show you some different websites that we've created. Um, okay, so development platforms, you can go like, um, there's things like Wix.com, Shopify, Squarespace, simple, you know, low cost, you can, um, clients, we, you, me, anyone can kind of go onto these systems and pretty much build a website from, from scratch. Yeah. At the other end of this, of the spectrum, we've got, you know, large website systems that actually they have, they've got a, they've got a front end and there's a view for people in the wider world to come and interact with those websites. But if you look underneath the hood, they're actually completely integrated into an organization's systems. And so the content management system might be connected to the CRM and it might be connected to the accountancy system, might be connected to the timesheet system. It might be con connected to all sorts of systems. And so it's actually a large piece of integrated software. And then you've got everything in between. And I suppose, let's just talk about, about the, um, the self, the self build system. So I'm using the word here, multi-tenancy, because I think the thing to really understand about those types of systems, so Wix and Squarespace and Shopify is that the, what multi-tenancy means is that it's, it's, it's one piece of software. Let's take Shopify, for example, Shopify has built a system so that people can go into their system and then create, if you like, a virtual website that actually isn't really a separate website in, in, in the true sense. It's just a portion of part of the Shopify website, but it's rendered, it's made to look like a separate website. And so that's, from a cost perspective, it's absolutely brilliant. From a speed perspective, it's absolutely brilliant. It's relatively simple. To, do, to build these types of systems. The, the, the major downside with them is that if you ever want to move away from Shopify or Squarespace or Wix or those types of systems, you never can because you can't pick up your website and put it over here. So in truth, it's, it, it's, um, it's intellectual property that is constantly tied to that particular supplier. So the only way that you could, if you got clients that are on the, these types of systems, they, they, they essentially have to start again. If they want to own their own websites, I would argue that most, you know, businesses, organizations out there that sort of are, are in the business of growing and, you know, being valuable, you know, not owning your own website is not a great idea. So for me, those types of systems, when we're talking about clients, they should only really use them if it's like some sort of time limited event and it's just, they want the website to promote the event 
and then you're just going to turn off the website again. I, I wouldn't advise any clients to be putting, you know, valuable business processes and building them in into a system that they don't own. Now, having said that, you know, I, you know, my personal website, I, I use Squarespace. You know, I have no issue that because I'm not, you know, it's just for me, it's, you know, and it's low cost and I keep it up there and that's fine. So there are places when these things work really well. And Wix is one of them. You know, lots of people use Wix and it's very easy to build. Shopify is like a multi-tenancy website that's specifically focused on, um, on building e-commerce platforms and Shopify you know, lots of people have very positive experiences with that and then Squarespace you know I, you know Squarespace for me orientates itself around like individual profiles it's almost like if you want your own personal website Squarespace is quite a good option all of these all of those platforms you know there, there is cost it's just low and it's, it's a monthly cost okay and then let's come on to um, and I'll talk specifically now about custom built um, websites on WordPress. So WordPress started off life as a blogging platform and it, and it still is, but there's, when we talk about custom built WordPress websites, it's like the majority of websites in the world from very large organizations like, yeah, I believe Nike and I think Disney have some of their properties on WordPress. You know, very, so you can have very sophisticated, very credible, very complex websites built on WordPress. The key thing is here, it's built on the, Word, it's built on the WordPress source code. It's not like a multi-tenancy system where you build it inside the WordPress um, you know, walled, walled garden. You pick up that source code, you put it down, you develop it and turn it into into a, a website that, that actually the, they are, the, our clients will own, the organization itself will own. And so this, I suppose, about 50% of the websites that Mint Twist builds will be in, or probably more now, will be in, um, <coughs> will be built on top of WordPress. So this is um, Tungsten Network, um, you know, there, there are, a relatively large, you know, B two B tech um, company. They build out, you know, software platforms that let large businesses uh, run all of their financials and commercials on. And this is a relatively new website, and this is built on on WordPress. And Tungsten, you know, obviously own this website. It went live, I think, last week. Um, <clears throat> this is. This is an example of a subscription commerce. So these are the kind of e-commerce websites where you go on and then you sign up and then you've got a monthly charge and then you get stuff monthly. So for the PRs out there, probably these ones in the UK, you might recognize him. So this is James Middleton and he's the, um, the brother of the Duke of, oh, sorry, the Duchess of, oh my word, I can't remember what she's the Duchess of, but um, Kate Middleton is uh, married to our prince and he's her brother and he's sort of a little bit of a celebrity and he worked with Mint Twist to create this subscription commerce um, platform for pet food, for dog food specifically. So the idea is I think you... <coughs> so you go on, <coughs> you put you know, the name of your dog, you put the size of your dog and then it will create the perfect pet food for your dog. Um, you know, Bear Conductive, this is an e-commerce platform uh, built also on WordPress. Um, yeah, and there, there are many others. But so Mintus has got a really good speciality of building like really, really nice functional WordPress based sites for clients and now, it's not just Mintwist, the majority of, of clients out there in the world that are, let's say, medium, <clears throat> large, and you know, even small companies, if, they, if their website is important to them and they want to do something, then have a look at WordPress as a, as a technology option because it's <clears throat> the cost to support that, um, that code you know, is relatively low because the skills are widespread. The licensing costs uh, are basically essentially zero. You might have to buy some plugins. 
Um, and it's, it's just a very, very attractive option for many reasons. Now, having said that, Mintus have also built um, .NET based systems, we built Oracle based systems, we built IBM based systems, Amazon Web Services based systems. So Mint Twist, uh, you know, Fin Partners Digital Europe is a technology um, independent advisor. Um, it sounds like I'm pro um, WordPress and we, we're not pro WordPress. It's like clients need to have a good reason not to use WordPress, if that makes sense. I'll leave it that way. Okay, and then um, as a final, as a final, uh, there's, and there's some more websites there for those of you who want to look at it. There's something about working with Robert's team. Um, they were quite interested in this tool, so let me just show you a website. If you type in website grader HubSpot, they've got this tool, um, which I hasten to add, it's, it, is, it is simplistic. Um, and it makes lots of assumptions, but it will give you, um, for any website that you want to put in, it will give you a kind of uh, an off, off the bat score of how, of how good your website is. Last time I did this, Mintress websites came up, it's very good, so I hope it still comes up as good, otherwise it'd be really embarrassing. Um, that was a few weeks ago. Oh no, it's gone from good to okay. It was really good. Okay. So this, so this is interesting. So Moat so it's saying performance, nine out of 30. We'll go and look and see what's going on there. Um, but mobile, this means how responsive is it? How well does it work on mobile? This means how well is it optimized for SEO? And this is how security is. Um, so it's identified some issues and some of our pages look a little bit too large and some of the pages, and for that reason, some of the pages are running a bit too slowly. Um, mobile is full marks and there's some JavaScript that it doesn't like. So the key thing is here is don't think that this is a precise answer. As I said before I run the score, it's a kind of indicative. If you just want to have a look at a website, you know, you can run it through this, this tool. Um, another tool that you can use is the Google Page Speed. So if you type into um, a browser, Google Page Speed Test, you can, for free, you can put in any website and it will test the speed of the website on desktop and speed on mobile. Um, and then look, again, we've had conversations with a few people out there who said, oh, can you look at our client's website and tell us what you think? We can look at a client's website from you know, anecdotally, and you can put it through website grader, you know, to be clear, Mint Twist don't really use this tool because it's not reliable. What we would always prefer to use and what we would strongly advise that you strongly advise your clients to use is get access to Google Analytics and the Search Console. And once you've got access to this tool here, which is called Google Search Console, and every client will have this, it's just they might need to ask someone to just provide you view only or us on your behalf, view only access to this. Once you get in here, you can tell a huge amount. And in, trust me, when we provide some top level insights to our you know, marketing managers, comms manager type people, they're always absolutely fascinated with what they see. Because in many cases, it, it's the data has been there. It's just there's no one internally that either knows or has been communicating that. To, to more comms people inside clients. So getting access to Google Search Console or analytics allows us to tell a huge amount and you know, normally to open up some really good conversations. I hasten to add, it doesn't need to be admin access. You can, these tools are 